Okay. I'm just going to really lay out quite quickly why we decided to have a vision night tonight. Why did we all set it up differently and ask you to come and share vision? And it is about sharing vision. It's not about coming and being spoken to. It's about the call going out, just as Andy has, has spoken in a prophetic rhyme. You know, it's the word of God we've just received there. And it's about calling us to vision together. And whenever I hear the vision by Pete Gregg, that amazing 24-7 vision of Jesus, I just think to myself, my goodness, what a long way I have to go to have a heart open and beating like that for Jesus. And I tell you, I won't be able to make it unless we all go together, because that's the whole point of that vision. It's not one man's vision. It was 24-7's vision, and it really, it's not even 24-7's vision, is it? It's the church's vision to together hold on to Jesus and one another like that. And we just won't make it unless we hold on to one another. So tonight is meant to, part of its purpose, hopefully, is to inspire and motivate us to see our part in the together that we need to grow in our love for God to disciple others and to impact our world. And I was reading, who, who's got the Bible in a year app? Somebody put me onto it and I've been reading it most days. And I don't know if you read it today, but there was a little bit in there from Jeremiah. And it just said, and, and Nicky Gumbel, who does the little commentary that goes with it, he just said this out of that passage. You are not on your own. God never intended you to fight your battles alone. He called you to be part of a strong, healthy, vibrant, growing community of his people. Together you can stand firm, resist backsliding, and move forward. And as he, Jeremiah speaks to the fallen nation of Israel, and God promises restoration to them. And he promises it in four main ways. And he promises it in the rebuilding of them as a people and the rebuilding of the city. And he promises joyful worship. Well, hopefully you've had a little bit of that tonight, but we probably could give that a lot of a lot longer, couldn't we? But songs of thanksgiving and the sound of rejoicing. It says that, that we will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord. They will be like a well-watered garden and they'll sorrow no more. So restoration involves joyful worship. Numerical growth is the second thing that God promises. He says he will add to our numbers and we will not be decreased. This is a blessing from God. So we've got to pray for it, plan for it, and prepare for it. Are we prepared for an increase from God of people, because we're going to be busy, aren't we? So we've got to make a bit of a plan for that and start praying it in, because it'll be a good sort of busy. And the third thing he promises is strong community, the fact that we will be established together and will be a community that God himself takes pride in, a strong, immovable people who support and help one another to stand firm in life and to keep advancing that kingdom forward. And the fourth thing is he promises good leadership. Again, pray for it. Prepare for it. Those who he will draw near to him to be close to him, and they will devote themselves to being close to him. We are loved with an everlasting love, and God is rebuilding and restoring us, his people. He's going to watch over us like a shepherd, and he's going to redeem us out of enemy hands. And these four things will be a sign of those things coming. So part of what we're here for is to inspire and motivate us to once again believe for all of those things, God increasing, God drawing us near, being a people where the leaders, and we're all leaders in our communities in one way or another, are close and near to him and moving together with him in his flow, which is exactly what Andy said. So that's the first thing then, to inspire and motivate us all to see our part, and to be passionately involved in God's specific calling on us as City Life, because there's many churches doing great things, but God has placed you here. So what is it that he has a specific calling upon City Life for as part of the wider vision of the church in this city, the nation, and the nations? We want to... We have a particular DNA that he's given us that we have to outwork, that we have to function within. And part of our DNA, if you really want to get an idea about it, is written up on the walls here. 
And you know that as a church, we've been called to love God, love one another, and love the world. I think every church would say that's their vision. It's the standard vision from the Bible. It's the standard vision of what we're all about. But we particularly um, saw three strategic priorities in that, which you will see on your leaflet. Um, we saw it as passionate spirituality, which is what that vision of Jesus is um, really the heart of. Missional discipleship, taking people on a journey from not knowing God to knowing God by walking with them in various ways. And, and hearing from God creative solutions to the world's problems, our city's problems. And as it so happens, all the words that we've received, probably on this side, these ones are all about the passionate spirituality. How if we will draw near to God, these are the things that will begin to emerge. And the impact of them here in missional discipleship and in creative solutions that actually impact the the world and cause it to flourish are probably on this side. So it just so happens that our strategic priorities are actually up there in everything that we're believing for there. And that is the particular DNA that we have been given, the particular call that we've been given, because these words have all come out of prophetic words that have been given to us as a church specifically. So they are ones that we hold in particular as who we are called to be together. And we can't be it without each other and without us carrying the vision together. So I think probably that's all I want to say other than to say so the rest of this evening is going to be a little bit about exploring those things and hearing from some people involved in these areas and I'm going to hand over to Nikki to see us through that bit. Thank you Bev. So how can we play our part? Um, I'm going to introduce you to a few people for those stories to encourage us all. I want to start with the first area of passionate spirituality. It's been really exciting but w because we've been seeing new rhythms, new patterns and new communities emerging, particularly in the last year. We've seen the sacred space become more used, um, more used, used more regularly, <laughs> sorry, um, by groups and individuals. So we've had Groups in there praying for the prodigals to return. We've had groups praying for women involved in the sex industry. We've, we've been having groups praying for families on the estate over there in the sacred space. The prophetic community is formed. They've also been gathering in the sacred space. Uh, but that's been gathering momentum. Southampton House of Prayer has emerged. We've been privileged to hear more from Rich and Kathy Pitt and others from City Life that are involved. That includes about 27 people from 11 churches across Southampton, so it's not a City Life thing. So I just want to hand over to Lena and Jim just to come up and give us a few highlights uh, from the House of Prayer. Let's welcome uh, Lena and Jim, please. It's the tussle. Who's first? Go, Lena. All right, so, um, yeah, we've been a part of um, the discernment group for um, the House of Prayer. Um, it's been very challenging for me. I think that, um, well, initially I thought I had, you know, good spiritual rhythms and all of that sort of thing, but um, being a part of the discernment group um, was very challenging because it was introduced new disciplines and things like that, um, learning new things, um, different kinds of prayer, and, and just sort of, you know, we were a group with a purpose. We, we are a group with a purpose. And initially, I kept forgetting our assignments and stuff like that. So I felt like I wasn't pulling my weight. So, you know, I had to really, put, you know, get it together. Um, but it's been really powerful. Um, we've been looking at, um, oh, goodness, um, not just looking at new things that we're looking for God to do through the House of Prayer in Southampton, but um, looking at, looking back, um, we did a tour of the city and um, talked about the spiritual history of Southampton and realized that um, there are some foundations that we can build upon, that um, there are some really powerful things that God has already done in Southampton. Th there have been some moves of God in Southampton already. And just sort of um, looking at all of that and, like, like I said, different forms of prayer, um, we were asked to... Um, sort of prayfully reflect, um, um, I sort of consider what God may have put in us for the house of prayer. And, um, and that was really powerful. And I think I, I, I said one thing that 
you know, one time. And then we've been just talking about it some more. And um, the other day we talked about it again. And it was really exciting because I started to realize that through all of the exercises and all the things that we've been doing, it's been stirring up a lot of stuff, a lot of um, passions and things that I had sort of forgotten that, that God had put in me. It's been stirring it up and sort of reminding me of different things. And so when we were discussing it this time, I had like list of stuff that I felt like, oh, you know, like I have these real contributions. And so it's been a very refreshing, exciting, um, interesting thing for me. And it really has stirred up a lot of new passion and, and I feel quite excited about um, what God's going to do. Yeah. And you said you didn't want to follow me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tina. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, for me, I've carried a real heart, a real burden for so many years to see unity in the church. Mm. And like Nikki was saying, it's been such a privilege just to meet with a group of people from such a wide range of churches around Southampton. And I know within our group as well, there's a hunger to see more of that as well and to really expand that. Um, and I think just the kind of initial kind of journey that we've been on, I think like all of us just sort of meet on a Wednesday night and feel quite excited about being there and excited feeling that God has put us together as a sort of motley group of people to sort of release something that he has for this city. And um, I think like I've always been quite down on Southampton, having been born here and growing <laughs> up here. And um, <laughs> I've always spoken quite badly about Southampton in a lot of different ways. I've tried to get away from here as much as I can. But I think like it, it's been quite a surprise for me to kind of be on this journey where we've kind of like um, been treasure hunting. And so we felt that like God had said to us that he um, wanted to reveal treasures in the city that had been hidden. And so um, we did a lot of research. And as Lena said, there was sort of like a historical tour of Southampton, but we've sort of chosen different areas um, that we felt God put on our heart and really explore the history of those and have found that God has really revealed to us what he's been up to in this city over the generations and generations and generations and has really sort of challenged us that he wants to kind of um, unblock the wells and release um, blessing over this city. And so I think for me, I've kind of discovered a bit of a passion for Southampton <laughs> and... I'm quite excited about what God wants to do in this city. What a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Lena. That's really encouraging to hear. And we want that, don't we? Fanning the flame of love and passion for God so that we're really burning brightly. I just want to finish uh, this section by just reading a prophetic word that um, Tracy gave us um, as City Life in ja on the 31st of January of this year. I saw water coming out of a rock and I saw someone striking the rock. It made me think of the story of Moses who strikes the rock. That's Exodus 17. God said, the power is not in the stick, it's in me. He said, living water will flow from obedience. And obedience comes from hearing me, knowing my heart, my voice, my word. God, thank you, God. <laughs> God then said, discipling and accountability, and said, what do you put your faith in? The stick, a method, or me? He then went on to talk about faith like a mustard seed says in Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus said to his disciples, you don't have enough faith. I tell you the truth, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would be possible. It would move, because nothing would be impossible. God prefers to work with small, pure faith in him, rather than big faith in other things like methods, sticks. In this next season for City Life, he said, every sheep counts. Not every sheep yet hears and obeys. 
The sheep can get lost if they do not know how to follow the shepherd's voice or know the shepherd's calling. But he wants all his sheep to hear him. Because hearing God, faith and obedience bring the flow of living water. And that's what we want, isn't it? We want to be a community that loves God passionately and hears him and follows and obeys. That we can see that living water overflowing uh, in our city, to our friends, our family and our community. I want to hand over to Debs now, who's just going to tell us a, a few stories from the way we can do that through missional discipleship. Where's Debs? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to share a little bit about um, the Living Room Cafe, which we've quite recently started. Um, just before I do that, I'm just going to share a little bit personally, which hopefully explains the vision behind the cafe a bit more. Um, so I live about two minutes away from here. And since living here, I've met lots of different people, made lots of new friends. Um, and a lot of those people are in quite desperate situations and in desperate need. Um, to name a few of the situations without naming any people, I've met single parents that are struggling to make ends meet, um, providing for their children, and sort of let alone getting a moment to consider their own needs. Um, I've met an 18-year-old who's homeless and battling quite severe mental health. Um, I have met a lot of children who seem to wander the street endlessly so they don't have to be at home. I've met teenagers in quite abusive and violent relationships. Um, people who are suffering with quite serious illnesses. So the list sort of goes on. And I'm sure as I'm saying these things, you're probably already thinking of people that you meet either in work, college, uni, neighbours, who are also facing just life's challenges because they seem to hit us quite a lot. Um, so as I said earlier, I have had the pleasure of being able to get to know a lot of new people. Um, and I've been able to share my faith with these people and not just that, but also um, introduce them and pull them into community. Um, and I can't tell you what a huge impact this has had. So I'm probably the kind of person that when I see a problem, I instantly think, how can I fix that? But actually, these people's problems aren't fixed. And in fact, sometimes I meet people which it seems to just keep coming, keep coming. But for the first time, I think that they're not alone, actually. They really feel like they're not alone. So they've got people who they can call and talk to. They've made friends that they can do that with. They've made friends um, well enough to be able to actually feel comfortable to ask for help. Um, they know people that they can actually ask for prayer, whether they want to pray with someone or just ask that someone prays for them. You know, people are on their own journey and, and will want different things, but that's really exciting that people feel they can do that. Um, and also, they can come along to things. They can come along to people's houses. They can come along to groups. They can come along to church. They feel, you know, comfortable to do that and get the moral support and the love that they need. So there are so many people, some of us included, um, that are struggling with just everyday situations. Um, but when we're part of a God-centered community, it just brings such comfort and support to know that we're not alone. And that's really the heart behind the cafe. So we wanted to just create a space, firstly, where church can gather um, through the week and secondly where anyone whether they're part of church or not can just come and find belonging. Um, the cafe is called The Living Room and we named it that because we wanted it to feel like a home from home and we also just recognise that The Living Room is where you just share life with friends and family um, and also just the word living just felt really important. Actually, we want people to walk through the door and just experience our living God. And um, yeah, so that, that's behind the name, really. Um, 
it's worth saying that the cafe hasn't, it's not like this all singing, all dancing, running cafe every day. We didn't have the resources or the people at the moment to do that, although we hope to soon. Um, but we started initially on a Monday morning for parents and carers and their children. Um, so we already had lots of parents who had built into Precious Gems, which was a play group that Mel Pooley used to run. And with that ending last year, we had lots of people that we wanted to provide a space where they could continue to build community together. Um, we've now also teamed up with the Open Door Group. So that meets on a Tuesday and it's for adults who, um, some are homeless, some are vulnerably housed, some are out of work. Um, so they are able to come on a Tuesday and we host brunch between 10 and 12. Um, we now are running the cafe on a Friday jump around in the morning and our newest um, event is that the cafe hosts a after school choir club on a Friday. Um, and also uh, I think Vix and Ruth are hosting some student nights through the cafe as well. So. Um, if you want to know more about the student nights, Vix and Ruth, give us a wave. Go and see them afterwards. Um, so our hope for the cafe is that as more people build in, we can have more sessions running for more groups of people um, and eventually have a cafe that is open all the time and that hosts something for everyone. So we hope that it becomes a place where tired parents can come and bring their kids after school when they haven't sorted dinner, um, maybe hosting cooking sessions where people can learn to cook a simple meal and enjoy eating together, um, where students can come and find friendly faces, where people can come and enjoy different activities and events, where kids can come and find something fun to do after school, where teenagers can come and find a safe place. I could go on and on, but I'll shut up now. Um, so, yeah, it's another space that enables us just to gather, build, and thrive as a god center community and where we can share that and build with others who are just desperate for the love and comfort and support that community brings. So, yeah, that's what's behind the cafe. If you want to get involved, come and talk to me. Still with us? I've got slides, slides. Hopefully. Does anyone like caviar, by the way? Do you like caviar? <laughs> Little fish eggs. I think we'd rather have bread, wouldn't we? <laughs> ah, so, is that there? What do you have to do? Come out back in? Okay, I was just going to share a little bit, um, another missional discipleship thing that we've got. I was going to share that with Runa, and then I was going to run through a couple of the creative solutions and give us a bit of a framework to think about that. But uh, three years ago or so, I went out to, oh, brilliant, I wanted the lights off for my video. Uh, <laughs> three years ago, I went out to Canada and went to see Young Life in Canada, and I was bowled over it by it. Some of you might remember that. Young Life is massive in North America. Worldwide, it's bigger than Uber, I learned this month, because it's in over 100 nations and Uber's in 78. Um, so Young Life is a massive thing, and they've got a camp in Scotland. Over the last three years, I've been working to get uh, some of our young people from Southampton up to the Young Life camp in Scotland. And so I got a little video from that, and then Runa went to Scotland, to Cambrai, it's called. And so I'm going to get Runa up to speak. What? You lost at table tennis to me earlier, Egbert, so. Here's the video. Sound? Is there sound? I've got sound on my laptop. <laughs> oh. Dan's gonna help with sound. You can spot Runa, potentially, and Egba, and Sam there is from Southampton, that lad in the black shorts.
So this is just like one of our days up there. I'll give some commentary. Water balloons flying, yada, yada. <laughs> and they had some good GoPro cameras, etc. So it possibly has an, oh, is that you, Egpa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's bring Runa up to speak then. If you could sort the sound for my next video, that'd be great. Runa! Okay, Runa, so that was a pretty crazy afternoon, that one. But what else did we get up to in Scotland? Did you enjoy it? Yeah. Uh, we jumped in the lock one too many times in Scotland. It was freezing, but it was good fun. Um, we learned to do stuff as a team, so... Raft building. Ours kind of broke in the middle of the lock, so <laughs> two of us had to swim back, but yeah. Um, canoeing, that was quite fun as well. Uh, I think I capsided once. Um, we had a, uh, an escape room based on Narnia, which was like very brain wracking, and one of my friends gave their life to Christ at the end of it, which was really good. So, um, no, just one more. I got one more question. This is um, Caitlin's in the green, Runa's in the background, and Bethan is a young life worker for Southampton. And uh, you were all in the cabin together. And at the end of each night, there was a talk about Jesus, and then there was cabin time. What did you learn in that cabin time? Um, so, each day, we had a guest speaker, Andy, talk about something. We had stuff like value and need and purpose. And when we got back to our cabins, we had to get food, and then we talked about what we'd gotten from the talk, and it was just really nice. So we all kind of pitched in loads of different ideas, and then I remember two of them, Caitlin and this other girl, Poppy, were really excited, and once Poppy asked, how can God hear all of us? And I just thought it was wonderful, because she's n new to the whole Christianity thing. So we explained it to her that he's like this father who just has like massive ears, who can hear all of us at the same time, and it was really fun, and... Yeah. Brilliant. Give Runa a round of applause. You did well. So, um, yeah, we took, we took uh, students from the Oasis Academies and from Cantel, took younger ones, older ones up there. Not today, but another time. And, and I took kids from uh, one of the academies, completely unchurched and really struggling at school. One of them had been suspended from school the week before for bad behavior. The vice principal sat me down the day before and said, Paul, you can't take this child. He's going to be a menace to you and it's caused trouble and it might damage the reputation of our school. So I, I said, well, we could fear that or we could believe that something good might happen in his life and I'll take the risk on my head be it. And she said, yes, it will be. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> and then I took him and he also, his guy called, well, he gave his life to Christ um, at the end of the week as well. It's amazing thing. And, um, yeah, and so the vice principal, she did eat her words, and she was really pleased that he had uh, a great week. So, have we got sound now? Do we have sound? Who knows? No idea. Let me just, I wanted to move on to creative solutions, but this, there's a little battle scene I want to show you. But Susanna is very patient with me, my wife. And over the summer, after I'd done two weeks of summer camp, I was tired. Even I was tired. And... Um, I sat down to watch Band of Brothers tip box set. Has anyone seen that? It tells the story of um, the American parachute company, Easy Company, who parachute into Normandy on the 6th of June, 1944. And then they go through that battle, and then they're not just lifted back to America. They then fight on all through the autumn, all through the winter. And there's one battle scene I wanted to show you. Uh, when they were in a, they were in a pickle uh, in Belgium, because... One of the commanders has sent a group of the American troops round to the back of the German village. And it was the wrong place to be. They were doomed where they were. They had no radios on them. So this Lieutenant Spears from Edinburgh was stuck. He was like, what do I do to go and save my men? <coughs> he had no radio and he's trying to work out what to do. The Germans were all there. And because they're prepared, they've got white uniforms on. You'll see them in this little video. Uh, Maybe we could turn the lights off, could we? That is all right. Someone helps out. Um, so the Germans are all there in the village. They're about to attack, but he's worried about the guys at the other side of the village, what to do. And then this is a true story. If you watch Band of Brothers, 
they actually interview the people that were involved in this battle. So they interview the major, they interview this Lieutenant Spears and say, is this true? Is this story a true story? And this is how they depicted it. So just watch this little battle. He's trying to work out how to rescue his men. No sound. That's a little clip. Thanks. Nice and loud. Um, so I don't know if you saw what happened, but the only way he could do it, he reckoned, was to run through the enemy camp. He ran all the way through the Germans. They couldn't believe what they were seeing, that he was right there in their midst. And then, having sent the message to I Company, they were called to come back, he then thought, I'll just run back the way I came. I'll run back through the Germans. <laughs> And so they, again, you know, just looked at disbelief. A few of them got a few shots off towards him, but he ran back. And then the rest of his company were like, did you just see that? <laughs> and you know what? He then led them battle after battle after battle. And you can bet your bottom dollar that every single one of those men would follow him to hell and back, wouldn't they? Because he was fearless. Uh, he lacked no courage in going to save that. And that's what I probably particularly like about this band of brothers is that they were fearless in what they did. And... Um, and I guess for me, the creative solutions is about us not just staying static as churches and saying, yeah, we've got a good thing going, we've got a good routine on a Sunday, a connect group's nice, but actually saying we're in the midst of a battle and people out there, as Deb's described, um, are really hurting and really sad and need good news of Jesus, don't they, this man that we are obsessed with. And so the great challenge then for us, I think, is to be these fearless people that don't hide back in their trenches. I, I, have you ever done paintball? Whenever I've done paintball, I've just hid for my dear life. <laughs> Not wanting to get hit by those paintballs. But you, you see other people running headlong into battle. And that's what these D-Day parachute guys were trained to do, to just go running head on into the enemy camp. So I wanted to give you a few, few examples. I think there are some some people, some groups of people that are very broken and very hurt in, in the city. And as a church, we've been leading the way, you know, in a L Lieutenant Spears type way to actually say, we're going to dive into this and see what we can do. Risk of failure is high. The chance of us getting it wrong are high. The chance of us being on the front page of paper for doing it wrong are high, but we're going to do it anyway. So one of those things that we've run through this year is trying to tackle homelessness and so we put out a call for everyone who's involved in homelessness to come and join us in January uh, for a conference. And they all did. So that's, again, the first thing that could have gone wrong is people were like, what are you talking about? Who needs to call us together? But they all came, the MPs, the um, police, the health, the council, um, all the homeless charities, different churches all came to this thing. And we've done some good work this year. We've created a new website, a new app, Street Support, if you get it. Tells you how you can help the homeless. We've been... Um, created a new charter that was launched last week. That was another front page of the paper. And then we've also, this is what we're working on now, working on some new homes that could actually tackle homelessness. So made out of containers. You know, Southampton's got the most containers anywhere in Europe, in our city. So actually could convert some of those containers into emergency housing is going to be piloted this term off the back of that conference. And then we as a church have been contracted to lead this charge of partnerships around the city. So we won a contract over the summer 
to tackle that, that issue of homelessness. So we're the leading agency. It's bizarre, isn't it? Because it should be one of the hostels, so it should be the Salvation Army, but we've won it. But it's because we've been brave enough, really, to go into this arena where a lot of people are afraid to go. And the reason we're in there is because there's a waiting list of about six years for any sort of so social housing in Southampton. There's several hundred people that are sofa surfing in the city or crashing on someone's living room floor. And then there's 30 people, uh, which we're particularly focused around, that are sleeping rough on the streets every night. And historically, globally, around the world, throughout history, the people that succeed with those 30 people are church. Every city where it's worked has worked because of the church. <coughs> Every nation has worked has worked because of the church. Throughout history, you can check it. So we can't afford to not be involved in the arena because if anyone's going to make it work, it is the church that does it. So we're working with lots of other people. We're not doing that on our own. So, but with street pastors, with um, we're meeting with regularly with Victory Center, with lots of other groups, trying to look at how we do this. And then over this summer, we won um, not the church, but our partnership that we formed in January have won three hundred thousand pounds to work with these thirty people. It's ten thousand pound per person. It's a lot of money, isn't it, to get them off the streets? So. It's an absolutely fixed target that we're aiming for. We've been given a lot of money. If we're successful in getting that number down at all this year, we get another 450,000 next year. Massive amount of money to eradicate rough sleeping in the city. And the reason why we were given so much money is because we're working in partnership, which we stimulated <laughs> in January. So that's one great piece of news um, I wanted to share with you, and you can look out for stuff like that. Uh, you probably heard BBC Songs of Praise did a, a couple of weeks ago, they did a feature on these type of homes, so you could pick that one out. It was in Bristol. And then the other thing which is amazing is that we're the leading church when it comes to working with refugees and EU migrants in the city. So we've raised millions of pounds as a church over the last years to help people who have come to our city to find, what do we call it up there? City of shelter for the refugees and, str and stranger. We have raised millions, literally millions. And this summer we received half a million pounds as a church, so not as a partnership, but for us as City Life, to fund our work for refugees. Some people are mad about that. They're like, why, are you, why have you got money to help refugees? There's other people that deserve more money. So we're like, we say, well, like who? And they say, the homeless. Yeah, we're helping them as well. <laughs> we just raised 300000 for them. So this half a million is a massive amount of money to make a real difference in people that have come here uh, to find help. Some of you work, volunteer, and know the work of Clear Project really well. Um, there's other things that we've pushed into that we probably are not putting enough resources behind. So the waffle stop is one where we, we've worked really hard, haven't we, on getting the environmental health done. We had a visit a couple of weeks ago. All went well. Uh, every, everything. We've done loads of, loads of work on that to get the menu done, the recipe done, the whole thing working properly. But we, now we need to get it out the front of the building much more often, which takes time. So vision without people and resources equals frustration, doesn't it? So some of those projects, like the Waffle Stop, like Tanner Park Community Centre that we took on a few years ago, they need more people to get behind, but they're, they're ready to go. Um, and then other projects like Clear and so on are amazing. I was going to say one more thing, which was, I'm very proud of Nikki. Um, so this weekend, some of you may not know this, but her and her friends from Amber went into a strip club, which is not the normal pl two strip clubs. I didn't know what that sign meant in your strip world. <laughs> uh, not many churches would dare to go into those places, would they? And uh, so it's having that courage, that Lieutenant Spears courage to go into the enemy world. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus comes to bring life and life in abundance. So I was just going to finish with one, one or two lines from this prayer that Dan read out earlier. This vision will be, it will come to pass, it will come easily, it will come soon. How do I know? Because this is the longing of creation itself the groaning of the spirit, the very dream of God. My tomorrow is his today. Over to Dan.
It's exciting, isn't it? When I was younger um, and lived at home, I used to listen to a lot of jazz, believe it or not. My dad was a big jazz fan, um, and it had a bit of an influence on me. And I always wanted to grow up to learn to play the trumpet. Had great vision for it. I do not play the trumpet. I did nothing about learning to play the trumpet. Vision doesn't happen unless we do something. Um, as Paul said, vision without people to make it happen just leads to frustration, disillusionment, disappointment. These visions from God are great, but it does take all of us. It takes a family. Uh, it takes us. And so one of the things we wanted to do was to challenge us and our connect groups that we're part of to think about, okay, well, if this vision is so great and if it is from God and if we want to see it happen, what is our part in that? One of the things that happened at the uh, signing of the charter uh, on homelessness wasn't just that people came together and said, yes, we agree with this vision and we want to see it happen. It was, okay, well, what are the steps that we're going to take to make it happen what are we as individuals and organizations going to pledge to do? Not something we're already doing, but something we can take a step towards. Something that isn't already happening, what can we do? So one of the things you know, we're looking at uh, is homeless housing, for example. Not just the container housing, but uh, beginning a project in the city uh, to, to house people beyond that. Um, a number of the things that we already do, I know Bev's already mentioned this document, and we've, we've talked about... Um, the three strategic priorities, passionate spirituality, missional discipleship, and creative solutions. And on the inside, we've kind of plotted the things that we're involved in as a church and that we are doing in those areas, whether it fits into this uh, passionate spirituality, missional discipleship, and creative solutions, and whether it is about loving God, loving one another, or loving the world. And I, I guess I want to challenge us to spend a few moments around tables um, looking at some of those things and saying, well, which of those uh, is God laying on my heart? Which of those things can I make an impact in? Lena earlier talked about the contribution that she was able to bring to Southampton House of Prayer. The difference that she can make there. What is the difference we can make in some of these areas of vision for the church? So on the tables, there are some of these. This is our little vision night pledge card. Um, I want to encourage us to think and ask God, uh, what is it that we can do? What can we bring? Um, you may not fill it in now. You might want to take it away and reflect on it some more. But it could be, it could be a number of things. It could be uh, that you want to commit to gather people to pray for a specific thing. Because we need uh, prayer to underpin all that we do. It could be that you want to serve on a particular team, whether that is within the church on PA or hospitality or anything like that. Or it could be serving one of the projects like Amber that we've heard about or um, clear or hope into action or greenhouse. Um, you might want to serve at the living room or it could be that you want to review your giving, your tithe to the church, your offering uh, to give towards one of these projects. There's so many things that we could do as individuals and it may not be the same for any of us. But let's take time in the last few minutes around tables uh, to ask God about that, to challenge one another over it, to pray together, and then we're going to finish with a final song in a few minutes' time. But I do want to encourage us to take this back to our connect groups and into our communities and consider it together as well. So we're going to give you a few minutes, and then we'll invite the band back to finish.